Okay, good evening and welcome everyone. I know we probably still have some attendees on their way in, uh, but I also want to respect everyone's time. So we'll get ahead, go ahead and start and uh, everyone can join um, when they're able. Thanks for introducing yourselves in the chat box. It's lovely to see uh, some familiar names and some new names here with us this evening and, and that people are joining us from all across the country. So welcome. We're so glad to have you here to join us in this discussion of systemic racism with our collaborators and allies, Leaderpool and La Ligue des Droits et Libertés. Uh, before we get started, I want to share a few housekeeping points. Um, so this uh, event is two hours long. We'll try to end promptly at 8.30 uh, so that everyone can go off and enjoy their evenings or their bedtimes. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and shared afterwards with everyone who's registered and you're welcome to uh, share it beyond in your, net, in your networks. Um, please continue to use the chat box for introducing yourselves, for comments on panelists remarks, and also for any tech issues. Uh, my colleague Mary Tu will be doing tech support tonight and she can help anyone out if they're having trouble. Uh, if you do have questions for panelists, we ask that you use the Q&A box and we'll be recording uh, or keeping track of questions there and collecting them and, and posing them to panelists later in the panel. We do ask that you reserve that Q&A box for panelists questions. Uh, so I ought to introduce myself. My name is Charlotte Cadell and I'm the co-executive director of InterParis. I'm joining you tonight from the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. And I have my lovely colleagues, Eric Chiray and Mary Tuthiello on the call or on the uh, panel with me. InterParis is a feminist social justice organization that supports activists, organizations, and social movements in the global south, as well as here in Canada, addressing injustices within our own borders. Interpares means among equals, and it is as such that we work with our counterparts, not as Northern actors helping those in the South, uh, but as equals in cooperation and collaboration. Our approach is one of solidarity, not charity. Uh, in Canada, we work on various social justice issues, including economic inequality, environmental justice, gender inequality, migrant justice, and of course, racial justice. Recently, we were proud to contribute to the creation of an anti-racism framework for the international cooperation sector, uh, which has now been signed by many diverse organizations and can be found on Cooperation Canada's website. So as uh, Canada marks Black History Month, which is now nearing its end, we at InterParis and as uh, a group are asking ourselves, how can we resist rather than reinforce global structures of racism and colonialism. This is a question with which we are always grappling at InterParis. Uh, we're aware that as Canadians, many of the resources and privileges we enjoy have been gained through exploitation within and beyond our borders. Our solidarity with our counterparts therefore strives to address the global and political and capitalist power that Canada wields at the expense of other communities and countries. In the current context, we've seen a rise of hate crimes reported within Canada, uh, white supremacist groups being emboldened by recent political events in the United States and elsewhere, and multiple repeated and long-standing injustices suffered by racialized and Indigenous peoples within Canada. All of these factors led us to organize this, this event for tonight. I think many of us feel that we are in a moment of building momentum and of urgency to acknowledge and address racism and especially anti-Black racism. We must speak not only of racist attitudes and behaviors, uh, but also of systemic racism, which can be more insidious and can be difficult to perceive. When we understand the power structures inherited from a colonial past perpetuate these injustices, the possibilities for collective change are greater. Systemic racism does exist here in Canada and all around the world. And it is the responsibility of those who benefit from systemic racism to understand and challenge it. We all have a role to play in uprooting systemic racism from society 
by confronting the institutions and the policies that perpetuate it. But how do we do this? To help us with this huge question, uh, we have with us this evening three panelists who have rich experience in the matter. They will share stories of their struggles to advance racial justice in Canada. And so I'm very pleased to present to you Alexandra Pierre and Martine Alois from La Ligue des Droits et Liber Liberté, a Quebec-based organization with a mission to inform, defend, and promote the universality uh indivisibility and interdependence of human rights and we also have with us olive kamenyana from leader an organization that promotes the leadership of people of african descent so before i pass things over to them i'd like to let you know what to expect this evening alexandra will start us off with a presentation exploring the concept of systemic racism to provide a clear idea of what it is and how to recognize it uh, Alexandra, Olive, and Martine will then engage in a panel discussion, sharing their unique experiences and their perspectives. And then we hope to have about half an hour for discussion among audience and panelists. And as I said, please do share your questions in the Q&A box throughout, uh, which we'll collect and, and post to panelists as we go. Uh, so without further ado, over to you, Alexandra. Hi. Um... Nice. I'm very glad to be here. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation from Interpares. Um, I will share a PowerPoint. So I need the authorization. We didn't do that in advance, <laughs> but we can do that quickly. Um, so sorry about that. <clears throat> no, that's okay. I just realized that. There you um, go. So the idea for me is to introduce what is systemic racism. But before I do that, um, I want to say a few words about the territory I'm in with Martine. Um, and it's work to promote and to defend uh, um, human rights for all. La Ligue des Droits et Libertés has made it in its mission to raise awareness among non-Indigenous population about the issue related to self-determination of indig Indigenous peoples. This is why we wish to acknowledge that Martin and I are here in an uns, uh, in on an unceded, sorry, indigenous territory called Teotiage Montreal, which is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nation and today for a diverse and non-indigenous population, and with many many communities also living there. It's therefore with, the, with respect for the link to the past, the present, and the future that we recognize the ongoing relationship between the indigenous population and other communities in Montreal. Here we go. So, sharing my screen. Thank you. And there you go. Voila. So, uh, La Ligue des Droits et Libertés was founded in 1963. Um, its mission, um, as uh, Charlotte uh, was saying, uh, is to make known, defend, and promote the, the right recognized in the International Bill of Rights. And we have many activities. Uh, we intervene with government authorities to denounce a human rights violation. We do information, training, and awareness raising, like, like tonight, to make human rights issue widely, uh, as widely known as possible. Um, so the concept of race uh, appear um, uh, with colonization or a bit before colonization. Uh, as early as the 15th uh, century, Europe began a process of inferiorization of indigenous people of Africa um, and the Americas and Asia. Uh, based on the supposed superiority of European civilization um, of white Christian men. So they pretended uh, to have reached a higher stage of civilization and uh, those uh, European power 
uh, see coloniza saw colonization as kind of an aid to uh, the supposedly inferior races. Uh, of course, this analysis was very convenient to uh, for the coloniza colonizer uh, because it could it justify the treatment of the uh, the, the, the the bad treatment of the natives, um, uh, which by the way, was in, in violation of uh, a lot of principle put uh, forward, forward by those same European powers. So in the 17th century, uh, for example, a lot of the, uh, there was a, a few uh, debates uh, growing uh, about whether the Indian had a soul or not. At the end, the Pope decided that the Indian had a soul, but not the Blacks. Uh, the the black uh, people and the, the yeah the black so um, the 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 this fact this 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 event ma made the, the black um, uh, exposed to to uh, exploitation um, and uh, yeah to exploitation so in 1985 uh, 1685 sorry. Uh, there was the publication also of the Black Code in France, where Black were considered by the law as uh, goods, as movable assets, and could be sold as such. Uh, and also in the 19th and 20th century, uh, a lot of uh, um, pseudo-scientific research and anthropomorphic studies were going on. Um, in order to classify uh, human races. Um, of course, all of that was to differentiate it and to exclude certain group uh, from power and from the capacity to, uh, uh, um, to uh, uh, govern themselves as they were doing before. Um, <clears throat> It justify a different treatment um, in the colonies. Um, it's also, it was also a way to access labor forces um, to exploit the territory and the national resources of the territory that the U European conquered. Um, so in that sense, the construction of other is a, is an historical and ideological process that, that was um, based on attributing particular meaning to biological feature like skin color, uh, body parts or bodies, uh, um, uh, or, or bodies were given particular meaning um, that make them uh, different. Uh, that, uh, uh, yeah, make them different. And those differences were naturalized and essen essentialized. Um, but now we know uh, that uh, those, dis the, those differences were constructed. Um, I want to share this image, uh, this very interesting image from uh, um, Angelica Das which is a, Braz a Brazilian photographer. Uh, She's been doing a very interesting work. Uh, she visited 18 countries, six continents, and uh, to, to make photos of more than 4,000 uh, uh, people, included 150 people in Montreal. And um, she wanted to convey the idea that the same objective color label and this in a certain way can put you in a position of superiority or inferiority. So, and I want to quote her, she's saying, if the color white and black exist, they do not apply to the skin, uh, the skin color of human. We talk about white and black when we want to classify people by believing that some were superior to others. So we can see that uh, black doesn't really exist. It's more a shade of brown and that white neither doesn't really exist. It's more pink or beige and that the same color attributed to different people 
have a different meaning. And that's what all colonization was about. Um, can I have the survey, please? Great. So we're sharing a little survey with you. Here you go. So I want to I want to know um, which one do you think? Uh, what do you think um, about those events? Which one of these have occurred in Canada, uh, according to you? So we'll have a few minutes. Uh, actually, I'll give one minute. You can answer the poll, and then we'll come back to uh, to those questions. You still have 10 seconds to respond. There you go. That was a quick one. So, uh, abduction of Indigenous children for adoption or guardianship by the state. So, uh, everyone said that it happened in Canada. You're right. Uh, from uh, um, nine. Uh, 1930, uh, between, sorry, 1930 and 1980, 10,000 children were placed in residential school to kill the ending in, in them. The last residential school closed in 1996. We also know that a lot of uh, 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 babies just disappear from hospital. A lot of people who were sick also disappear. So Yes, that's right. A head tax uh, imposed on Chinese immigrants. So yes, uh, at the beginning of the uh, uh, at the end of the nineteen uh, of the yeah nineteenth century, um, a head tax was imposed on Chinese immigrants. The idea was to make sure that too much not too much Chinese um, uh, would come in Canada uh, and. Um, that th this tax was very expensive, about 50, more or less, 50, depending of, on, on the time, but more or less uh, $50, uh, $50, which was a lot. And uh, it was also a way to make sure that those uh, uh, Chinese immigrants would work to pay back the tax. Uh, the sale of black the sale of black children into slavery. So eighty eight percent of you said it happened in Canada, and you were right. Uh, not only the sale um, uh, and the exploitation of uh, black children uh, of black people, but also of indigenous people. So uh, in Quebec and in Canada. Um, Slavery uh, was uh, was uh, was uh, existed, and until the beginning of the nineteenth century, thousands of Native and Black people were reduced to slavery. Uh, the prohibition of Black people in certain business, of course, yes, it also happened here, and uh, not only uh, at uh, in the United States, and uh, we're talking about. Um, um, business like movies, cafe, but also uh, some fa faculty uh, such as the faculty of medicine uh, at McGill during the 1930s, uh, Jews and Black were refused there. Um, and quickly, um, maybe less known fact that all of those sentences were right. So as you know, um, malnutrition of indigenous children in order to see the effect on their health. So yes, there were uh, in some residential school and in some community medical test that was uh, 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 given to indigenous, mainly indigenous children without their consent 
or the consent of their parents. And one of them was uh, because the malnutrition were so widespread in residen residential school, sorry, that some search uh, research um, um, scientists decided that it was the perfect place, place to see what malnutrition could do uh, on human health. So uh, they, instead of giving them food, they, 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 they tested them. Um, law preventing people from South Asia from immigrating to Canada. Uh, well, same thing then for the Chinese ed tax. Uh, there was also people from India that, was prevent that, that were prevented to come to Canada. And finally, a town with a majority uh, of black population with no municipal service for, um, for which the construction of a railway, a prison, a fecal disposal site and an infectious disease hospital were imposed. So that's uh, the story of Africville in a nutshell. So Africville is a, is a city, uh, was a city near Halifax, and um, uh, there was a lot of discrimination of Black population there, and that's uh, uh, partly or mainly why all those things were imposed to them um, uh, until uh, the middle of the 50s where um, Africville uh, was destroyed uh, to construct a park. Here you go. So the idea was to say uh, colonization is also a fact here in Quebec and Canada. Um, and uh, um, slavery exploitation of rational, racialized uh, people is also a fact in Canada. We have to take that into consideration when we're talking about racism, uh, about uh, systemic racism. Um, racism is a part of uh, the very fabric of this country, of this province. And of course, it continues to influence our view of the world. <clears throat> so, uh, racism is, uh, for La Ligue, uh, a differentiated treatment. Um, and the idea, as I was saying uh, before, but today also, is to uh, exclude, uh, make an, a distinction to exclude. It can be practiced by uh, individual, but also as uh, by group and by an organization. Uh, we will see that after. And it's basically on the basis on, of characteristic like skin color, national or ethnic origin. Um, generally, we think about racism as uh, something direct, uh, something, something unacceptable, like insulting someone or uh, making degrading comment. Uh, or refusing uh, to rent an apartment to someone to someone who to hire this person on a company, um, and uh, the the murder of George Floyd last year was kind of the 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 the, the perfect with yeah you know what I mean the perfect act of uh, of abject racism by a policeman uh, that held his knee on a throat of a black man. But racism is not only that, it's also systemic in the sense that it's part of the system we live in. Um, it's, uh, we're impregnated by this system, by racism, but we also I, I, I are actor of this system. Um, the idea is that uh, power resources are not equally distributed uh, and um, it's distributed along a color line. So um, rationalized people have less power, less resources, uh, and this power, th this power, those resources are, are seized 
by uh, um, white people in the in in the sociological sense that I I, I developed before uh, at the expense of racialized people. So it's not enough to denounce individual uh, behavior. We have to think about it as something that is Im that impregnated uh, um, or institution or way of doing things uh, or values also. And uh, the systemic perspective of, of racism invite us to look at the mechanism, the structure, the institution, and the social system uh, that maintain the power and the privilege of the white people. So here is a very quick definition of what we, uh, we, we mean by systemic racism. So racism encompasses economic, political, social, and institutional action and belief which systematize and perpetrate unequal distribution, distribution of privileged resources and power between white and people of color. <clears throat> Um, so uh, the oops, the 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 issue is of power is very important in our conception at La Ligue of systemic racism. So uh, uh, black power at the time, Stoke Car Mitchell um, was saying this, and I think this quote is very interesting to understand what is systemic racism. If a white man want to lynch me, that's his problem. If he has the power to lynch me, that's my problem. Racism is not about attitude, it's about power. And I think it's a very, very powerful sentence to understand what is systematic racism. So when we talk about racism, we're talking about the tip of the iceberg. When, when we talk about systemic racism, now we're talking about the entire iceberg. And it's uh, 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 we have to 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 attack them, attack that. Here is another. Whoop, 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 what's happening? Here is another quote. It's from the Charter of Human Rights and Freedom in Quebec. So this quote is basically stating uh, uh, the right to non-discrimination or the right to equality as entrenched on uh, uh, on the charter. Um, in Quebec, so uh, race, color, religion, ethnic, national origin uh, are among the ground for discriminate or racial discrimination recognized by the charter. Uh, at this point, I also have to say that uh, um, we think at La Ligue that racism does racism doesn't operate alone. Uh, various forms of discrimination interact, influence, and often reinforce one another. So the fact of being uh, like black or um, Latina, for example, if we can use those category, well, we have to use them with, uh, with care, but still. Um, so being black and uh, uh, being, uh, having an handicap, uh, be, uh, have, um, being poor or economic, marginalized and being indigenous um, and uh, how uh, racism uh, interact also with gender is a uh, part of our preoccupation. Um, we also have to say that um, La Ligue uh, um, promotes the idea of the interdependence of right it means that we recognize that the realization of one right is linked to the realization of other rights. So if my right to equality or non-discrimination non is in danger, probably that my right uh, to health, uh, justice, safety, um, uh, this condition, uh, condition of labor will be in danger also. And uh, the entire, um, uh, so 
for a little more clarity and then I'll go to my example. Uh, the idea of systemic racism um, uh, or systemic racial discrimination is the result of systemic racism. So um, when you are you are discriminated uh, on a racial basis because uh, when you want to rent uh, an apartment, uh, it's about systemic uh, rash. It's about racial discrim ra racial discrimination, um, uh, and racial discrimination is part of what we and of how we think about systemic risks. I hope it's clear. But if you have any question we will have a, a question period. So two short example or two set of example on work and education and also on health and social services. And uh, after that, we can go to the Q&A. Um, example today, we're talking about today. An employment rate of rational group are, uh, of rationalized group in Quebec are, is almost double uh, of the one of the rest of the population. So there's a, a great gap between, for example, how people are paid. Um, uh, salary of black men are um, in general $15,000 uh, less than other white men, which is enormous. 20.2% uh, uh, of a total visible minority, which is the official term, uh, population, uh, was living in poverty compared to 13.1% for non-rational, racialized people. Um, in education, we have also uh, a lot of examples, like the Commission des droits de la personne et de la jeunesse, the Commission of uh, Human Rights in Quebec, uh, did a very interesting report uh, 10 years ago uh, and uh, uh, did a mise à jour uh, 10 uh, last year. And they were saying, for example, that uh, in school, there were more clothing surveillance for racialized girl, that uh, they were over, they were sexualized, adultify, um, a lot, they, they receive a lot of comment on their curbs, how they overemphasize them, uh, how they move into this world. They, they, they had a lot of comment. A lot of attitude of suspicion also were there towards black teen. So white or non-rationalized uh, teen who get together, it's normal. They wanna hang out, they wanna have fun. But when it's about black teen, it's very suspicious. Um, uh, there, over, uh, there is an over surveillance uh, uh, or of what they're doing in the schoolyard. Um, uh, the way they we uh, um, the teacher talk about them also like they're in gang. Uh, what are they up to? So there's a lot of this kind of attitude, um, and also we know that young rationals racialized male are often director, directed to professional school um, more than to university, regardless of their potential or even of their grades. Um, health and social services. So a few examples. Again, I think it's important to place what is happening right now. Uh, we had a commission, uh, it's called Laurent Commission, was looked who is still looking into the uh, uh, prote service uh, protection, youth protection services, sorry. And uh, one of the conclusion of uh, this commission is that play, they, there's uh, uh, play, black and indigenous children are, are placed more often than uh, white children out of their family and out of their community which uh, cause all sorts of problem uh, regarding their identity, cultural loss, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, rationalized people and indigenous people have 
an access to health that is more difficult. We saw that in Montreal North, um, very uh, racialized and very impoverished uh, uh, neighborhood of Montreal, where there was no, at the beginning of the crisis, there was no screening clinic, although uh, they were more uh, exposed to the COVID, while in downtown Montreal, where there was not nobody, but uh, uh, less people because the businesses and et cetera were closed, there were a clinic there. Uh, and uh, okay, I'll, I know I have to finish <laughs> my presentation, but I just want to finish by the story of Mr. Sinclair. Mr. Sinclair, 45, was, was, an, well, was an indigenous man who died of a bladder infection uh, in an emergency department in Winnipeg in uh, 2008. He was pronounced dead in the waiting room after, uh, after waiting 34 hours in this waiting room. He had, he, he, he had not been seen by any healthcare staff, despite vomiting, despite the call of the people around saying something wrong with this man, we have to do something. During the investigation after his death, um, the staff said that they assumed that Mr. St. Clair was drunk and homeless. Basically, what we can understand through the investigation, it's because he was indigenous. Um, so uh, he basically died of racism. And we can see also how a diagnosis during pregnancy or childbirth uh, can be tainted by racial stereotypes. And that's uh, cases that are, are still going on today. That's it for me. Oh, I'll stop sharing the, the screen. Thank you so much, Alexandra. That was excellent. Um, so we have some time before we move on to panel discussion for questions for Alexandra uh, about her presentation, questions of clarification, um, or just any engagement with what she's shared thus far. Uh, please do uh, add your questions to the um, Q&A box. I wanted to reflect that uh, what you were saying, Alexandra, uh, about the interdependence of human rights, it reminded me of this quote that I have long appreciated um, from an Indigenous artist, activist, and academic named Lila Watson. If you have come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And I think that that's some, a great perspective to keep in mind as we move into this discussion of how can we all be engaged in addressing systemic racism. Totally, thank you for that. Absolutely, I see that there's a question here um, <laughs> that I'd love your perspective on, Alexandra, that's been shared in the chat box. It says, if race is a construct, is there a term besides racism that could better be used to describe the unequal distribution of power and resources between white and racialized people or uh, racialized and indigenous people? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting question. And it, it, um, it's a debate that's been going on for a while. And we actually have a lot of this debate in my uh, work setting and around me. Um, race is not biologi biological, it's social, but race, like the impact, the, the social impact of race exists, it's there. That's why we still talk about racism. And that's why some uh, people, some researcher still talk about race, but in a social sense. And um, it's very rare to um, to encounter people who will say right now um, race as a biological basis, but however racism continue to exist and it's also have changed. Now we talk about neo racism. It's not based on the fact that you have a skin color or you have. A, this or that biological feature. It's more about your culture. So you have this culture, I have mine, but 
by a certain attitude, certain way of presenting thing. I'm, I, I, some people are saying my culture is superior to yours. So it's not anymore, it, it's never have been about biological, we, we understand that. But the, the argumentation is not anymore about biological, it's more about culture. So we can see that even though we know that the biological stuff is not right, it continue to exist. So for us at La Lake, but you know, things change and maybe in a few years, I won't think like that. But for us, racism is still the good term. I appreciate that, Alexandra. I know for me as a racialized woman, even though race is a construct, the racism I experience is real. The racism that I see other racialized people, black people, indigenous people, people of color is real. And so it's still a useful, a useful term to, to use. Any other questions? And, and Olive and Martine, if you have anything you wanna add um, specifically to Alexandra's presentation, you're welcome to, to do that now or any other questions from Alexandra. Um, I see a question here from Larry Newfield, Newfeld. Uh, what strategy would be most effective toward breaking down systemic racism in Canada? Governments in Canada say that they're acting to end systemic racism, but the steps to end systemic racism seem to be very incremental and less than effective? Hmm. Um, I think uh, we should put strategy in plural <laughs> because there's no, like I was saying, it's a big iceberg. So there's no way that from one point of view, we can destroy that uh, or from one perspective or place, we can destroy that. So. There's a lot of things, I think, and uh, Martin uh, uh, and uh, Olive will talk about that later, but I think there's a lot of things we can do. It's a huge problem. Um, I don't expect to get rid of this problem uh, in my last lifetime. That's sad, but that's how I see it. I think the idea of representation, the idea of um, changing uh, the, uh, the the way uh, institution function, um, uh, changing our, our practices, not only um, the government, which is very important, but I'm thinking, for example, organization like La Ligue or like Interpares, um, we talk about racism, but we still have a lot of uh, challenges in our own organization. And I think that, um, it's, it's about circle, you know? Like we are on this little circle. We are looking at the others, but we still have to act there and here. Um, so for me, uh, thinking about uh, um, um, uh, recruitment policies or is one way, but also when uh, we are in a panel or we are in a, um, uh, uh, oh, I don't know the word, sorry, uh, in an atelier. Um, workshop. Who, uh, workshop, thank you. Who's talking? Who's not talking? What? Which point of view do we have? Um, um, does it represent, it's difficult to talk uh, only about representation, but does it represent a large, uh, um, uh, a large specter of the point of views around? So, it's about very my like local, but it's also about macro. So um, there's no one. I'm sorry. There's no one solution, but I think uh, we can act on every circle. If I may, um, I've, I've, I'm I'm all the way with uh, what Alexandra has just said. Uh, I would just add, um, you know, when when um, when it's difficult to conceive of how things may change, I, I tend to think of things that have changed. 
Um, and if I think back of uh, the beginning of the women's struggle in the 1960s and 1970s, um, you know, women uh, could not authorize a medical intervention on their children. They couldn't open a bank account. They often couldn't have a check from the government in their own name if they were married. Um, you know, they were basically um, second-class citizens or, or treated as minor children, um, <clears throat> although they were adults. So, I mean, that was the situation not 200 years ago, but just hardly 100 years ago, um, or a little more, or no, hardly 100 years ago. So, um, and I, I'm not saying that the situation of women in, in society today is like all, all discrimination has gone. There are still a lot of problems to be addressed, but I mean, there have been important steps that have been made. And, um, and it wasn't like, there's not just one answer, like uh, it's not like, uh, you know, uh, an apple pie recipe, you know, where you just one, two, three, and you'll get the apple pie at the end. Um, so, you know, I, I fully agree with what uh, uh, Alexander was saying. It's like by all sorts of different measures at different levels that finally social, um, social value, social relations and power relations uh, get to be changed. And that's what we have to work on, I think. Yeah. And if I may too, <laughs> I think if we have to uh, start something, if there was one thing we should do is to recognize systemic racism and to be explicit about it. Not mm -hmm. to say, yeah, yeah, it exists. Uh, oh, how sad to be explicit and to pinpoint where it is, where we see it and how and 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 how we intend to to try to 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 stop it. So we I think we really and that's a that's a big question here in Quebec, but I think it's in general it's it's always a question about oh are you sure maybe it's just this guy who's like <laughs> we have to be explicit about it. For me it's yeah. very important. Yeah, I agree about that. It's really about rec recognizing the, the problem and also to change the speech and after to take action. But uh, uh, to me, uh, and uh, Alexandra talked about Quebec, uh, uh, it's not very easy. I would not even trust the authority when they try to put actions in place when they haven't recognized any, anything. So it's a kind of uh, political. So if you don't recognize anything, if you don't change your speech as a governor, I'm not sure that you would, whatever you would do, uh, nobody would follow you because mm. you are example, you are, you are serving as an example to the population and you are serving as an example for the institutions. So, but uh, I will continue in that. That's really my field, right? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I totally agree with you. And uh, uh, I think that in Quebec some and uh, other places, but I'm from Quebec. In Quebec, sometimes it's very political, it's tr strategical, but sometimes it's not. But um, either way, I think that if you have the wrong diagnostic, it's impossible to have the right solution. So we, that's why we have to be explicit about what is systemic racism mm. and how it's, it works in our society. Thank you so much from for um, to all three of you. There's such richness already in in the discussion between you and the insights you're sharing with each other. Um, I'd like to move us along now uh, to the panel portion of the evening and invite Olive uh, to start. Olive Kamayana is the chair of the board of Leaderpool and founder of Leaderpool, uh, which is uh, the organization for leadership for people of African descent. Leaderpool was born out of the realization that Black people are not represented in Canadian political and institutional bodies, whether at the municipal, provincial, or federal level. Olive is a manager in the Federal Public Stu Service, and she's also a doctoral student at the Université de Québec en Outaouais, where she is studying public policy and the social responsibility of Canadian mining companies abroad. Olive, uh, please take it away. 
Thank you. And uh, seriously, I'm very happy for this partnership between Leader Poor, Inter Paris, and Ligue des Droits et Libertés. Let's talk about Leader Poor, political leadership for people of African descent. Leader Poor is really a response to the Canadian historical context where few people represent Black communities of African descent in political Canadian governance bodies where decisions are made. Those decisions have an impact on the future of all Canadian, including Black communities. While the political discourse in recent years has shifted in favor of gender parity, and we are happy for that, Little has been said for people from Black communities of African descent to undertake active politics and take an active interest in local, provincial, political governance and also institutional governance. Leader Paul celebrates the decade 2015-2014 proclaimed by the U United Nations General Assembly for people of African descent. The decade highlights African descent participation in political life often remains low in terms of electoral votes or holding of political post positions. Leader Paul strives for the recognition of the skills and the presence of Black Canadians in leadership positions in Crown corporations at all levels, municipal level, provincial level, and the federal level. Since 2019, when Leader Paul was uh, created, funded, uh, founded, and also launched, Leader Paul has received support of the Canadian community from coast to coast. Leader Paul counted on several partners, including the Canadian Commission for UNESCO, the Institute of, on Governance, some Canadian politicians, and media. Leader Paul is a partner of associations that form civil society across Canada. Leader Paul works with the leaders of the various government authority authorities at all levels, again, as I said, uh, local, provincial, and national institutions, to ensure that those institutions are fully capable of applying, monitoring, and adapting laws and policies so that they represent and respond to needs of Black Canadians. These laws and policies relate to employment, education, health, housing, and above all, the right to full active participation in the governance of our country and in decision-making. In Canada, as you know, we are over 1.1 million Black people of African descent, with this, with from from different origins, from different continents, including America and Africa. We speak French and English. We have college and university degrees, and we have acquired different experiences, nationally and internationally. However, our presence in the positions appointed at the discretion of governors remains lacking. Our representation in both houses of the Canadian Parliament, in the national assemblies of provinces and territories, and in the municipal, municipal councils of cities is still a challenge. Leader Paul encourages black people of African descent to get involved in and get into politics. Leader Paul raises questions about why Black people are not appointed as CEOs of Crown corpor corporations or as members of the board of the directors that run our, our, our institutions? Why members of Black communities are not appointed in a diplomacy or in the judiciary as judges? Why aren't we visible on television as hosts or as main actors in the leading roles in series? Why is a portion of the available funds not dedicated to artists or creators 
of the culture industry from black communities? Why the leaders of black communities are not appointed as president and the chance or chancellor of Canadian universities, principals of schools or CEO of school boards? For reader, for reader Paul, it's unacceptable that black youth are growing up without symbols. It is unacceptable that today in 2021, some government bodies and some political leaders still deny systematic, systemic anti-Black racism leading to discrimination. Those who recognize system, systemic racism also lack of real and appropriate level of actions. Leader Paul wants leaders' commitment to appoint Black people in their close political and decision-making teams. We are talking about the teams around, for example, the Governor General, the Premier Minister of Canada, the Premier Ministers of Provinces and Territories, members of Parliament, Parliament and members of Municipal Councils. These positions around the leaders are visible and, as you know, are involved in decision-making. They are symbols of systemic change that we as a society strive together to reach. Governing, governing leaders have the discretion to appoint, as you know, ambassadors, judges, and police chiefs. Such appointment in diplomacy and in the justice system are a positive representation of black communities and solution to reduce the systemic bias. We took a look at the management of some Canadian crown corporations. It is sad that, to note that the black communities are not represented at all. And those institutional crown corporations are, for example, um, Bank of Canada, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, CBC Radio Canada, etc. We have so many crown corporations that when you have a look on them, no black people are sitting on those board of governors. We also did analysis of uh, 12 uh, websites of Quebec Crown Corporations. The results were appealing in terms of the representativeness of black communities. Leader Poor ensures that our institutions are transparent in terms of numbers and openness to give everyone an equal opportunity. We did also the analysis of the governance of the city, for example, the city of Gatineau in February 2020. Like many Canadian cities in Gatineau, there is no elected representative for Black communities. There were also no Black people on the committees and commissions among the citizens appointed by the city. Fortunately, and we are happy for that, we have seen progress in, term, in terms of gender parity. Black communities are building on this example of women to lead discussions towards the same objective of representativeness. We must change the laws and the policies that give free reins to the racial profiling experience ex experienced by Black Canadians together regardless of our skin color, our origins. Let us share this dream from leader poor that the future will be a period of collective work against racism and the system, systemic discrimination. This is why this Tuesday, we launched Leader Poor Foundation to bring us together and raise awareness as a society and support Black communities, readers to build capacity towards running for political or becoming head state corporation of, of uh, corporations and preparing some people to become judge or diplomats. Thank you and uh, enjoy this 2021 Black History Month. Thank you so much, Olive. I um, really appreciate your remarks. I, I appreciate that we have among us the perspectives of folks who are advancing the leadership of Black people within institutions of power, and then also the perspective of folks challenging the, 
challenging outside institutions of power. And I think that both strategies, as Alexandra said, we must speak of strategies in the plural, are, are so important. Um, okay, I um, would like now to introduce <coughs> Martine Alois, uh, who is a board member of La Ligue des Droits et Libertés. Martine has worked in the healthcare and labor communities. Since 2001, she has been active with La Ligue as a member of the board of directors, uh, the population monitoring committee, the committee on race and the committee on racism and social exclusion. She is a fighter for the respect of the rights of all and has been involved in many other struggles, notably within the feminist movement and the collective échec à la guerre. Uh, Martine, please take it away. Good evening. Uh, first, I want to uh, thank Interpares for inviting us to um, be partners in this uh, webinar with uh, Olive Camignana. Um, it's an honor for us to, to be uh, partners with uh, Interpares. Um, so um, I'm glad to say that some of the points I was uh, uh, going to raise have been raised in the discussion just before, so I guess it means that there's a lot of agreement around. Um, I, I want to start off by saying that one of the assets, as I understand it, of the understanding of racism as being systemic is that it changes the posture of white people in society. We are called upon to move from the posture of I'm not a racist to I understand that I'm part of a system and that I should do something about it. Just a few words in passing. Those systemic, those systemic racism is relatively new for many of us. I want to draw attention to the fact that it was first developed in the early 60s by Afro-American activists, including Stokely Carmichael. Now, systemic racism, the systemic racism approach highlights the fact that we all play a part in the system, whether by our actions or by our inaction, and that consequently we have the responsibility to take action uh, and fight racism. We, we, uh, we now understand that racism is not just um, behavioral, intentional, and an individual posture. And so we're called upon to be proactive and to take action at various levels. At the level of our social relations, of course, but also and, and mostly at the level of institutional cultures and organizational policies and structures to harness the mechanisms, the practices, and the structures that participate in the perpetuation of racism in our societies. So uprooting racism, sure, but how do we go about it? Over the months, we've had several people come to us at La Ligue des Droits et Libertés with this question. What can we do? How can we be an ally? Tonight, I'll briefly present the main elements of our thinking at the Ligue des Droits et Libertés in response to this question. Firstly, as, um, as uh, many people, as uh, Alexandra and, um, and uh, um, Charlotte has, have mentioned already, um, the first thing we have to do is to name systemic racism, to break away from the rotten apples approach, the approach which, which suggests that it's just a question of getting rid of a few rotten apples while keeping our eyes closed on all the rest and the problem will be solved. This is tantamount to thinking that getting rid of a few misogynist men would do away with sexism in our society. We have to name systemic racism to know, um, to know what, we're, what it is we're fighting against. It's not simply a semantic, a semantic debate. Uh, I was reading an article this morning on this issue, and the journalist ended the article by saying, no matter how potent the medicine, it will not uh, be of any help if the diagnosis is erroneous. It's clearly impossible to grapple with a problem unless we recognize that it exists. In the 1970s, women's issues were thought to be entirely personal matters of no political interest. Until there began to be some admission of sexism as a social issue, it was even impossible for women's voices to be heard. So unless as a society, we accept to recognize the existence of systemic racism, it will be impossible to fight it. We will continue to take isolated measures which will only address superficial expressions of racism. 
Now, not only is it very important to name racism, further, it's important to name it correctly. In the past few years, we've seen a slew of new words appear, which are used interchangeably in the conversation on racism. Cultural groups, visible minorities, diversity, immigrants, victims of discrimination, and many others. There's nothing wrong with using these words in an appropriate context. However, we should be aware when they're used by people in position of authority to speak about race relations. Cultural groups, who does this refer to? Human beings are all cultural beings. So are we not all part of a cultural group or another? Diversity, what are we talking about? Diversity of gender, sex, class, training? Or are we using this word as a euphemism for non-white? So why not say what we mean? Why not speak about racialized people instead of diversity? How will a program for employment of recent immigrants solve the issue of discrimination in employment experienced by a racialized person? We were alerted to the dubious use of these expressions when following a call for a public commission on systemic racism. The Quebec government firstly proposed a commission on systemic discrimination and racism, which is fine, but quickly changed that for a seminar on the integration of immigrants in the labor market. In fact, these words used in the context of the conversation on systemic racism high, tend to hide racism rather than name it. Moreover, these terms completely avoid the question of power relations, which Alexander stressed is so central to the social inequalities and the poor living conditions of racialized people um, and are the direct consequences of power, which are the direct consequences of power relations in our society. So it's important to name systemic racism and to name those who experience racism correctly. They are not simply members of cultural minorities or immigrants. They are people who have been racialized by the majority group. Then secondly, it's important to document inequalities. To fight ra against systemic racism, we need to have an informed picture of the inequalities. For example, what is the percentage of racialized people in government bodies and at different levels of public institutions, on the boards of companies and in different job specialties? There are people who argue that by, by talking about race-induced inequalities, anti-racists are in fact re reinforcing racism. They argue that we are all equal and consequently should not pay any attention to race. It is true that we are all equal in, th in theory, of course. Unfortunately, this is not the case in everyday reality. We just need to listen to those who experience racism on a daily basis. However, more people began to be alerted to this reality when researchers came out with figures demonstrating, for example, that a person with the name of Tremblay or Gagnon has 70%, 60% more chances of being called for an interview than a person with the name of Traoré or Ben Said. We tend to think that it is not anti-racism, anti-racism, sorry, but rather color blindness, which contributes to the perpetuation of racism. There are tools such as gender differentiated analysis, uh, G, also referred to as G, GDA, now expanded to GDA plus or G, intersectional GDA, which includes racialized people. This tool was used to, by women to fight discrimination Nothing is perfect, but it definitely proved useful in the case of women. In the context of a consultation conducted by the Office de Consultation Publique de Montréal, the Ligue des Droits et Libertés proposed that the city adopt rigorous systems for data collection regarding systemic inequalities based on racism. This proposal was greeted positively by the city. Now we'll have to follow up on this to ensure that it happens. Thirdly, we should propose measures to counter biases and structural obstacles. We could adopt inclusive hiring practices with binding targets, departing from closed circle contacts in the boys club, reviewing job requirements, etc., and establish quotas for racialized people in various positions. We could implement 
positive action measures and or equal access employment programs. Once again, these programs were mainly used to promote women's access to certain positions or jobs, titles, with positive results. We could also develop innovative promotion strategies. These measures can be useful, but we must be vigilant and ensure that they are not just good intentions and empty words to brush up the public image of an institution or an enterprise. The adoption of such measures does not relieve us of the obligation to be vigilant and to track down the discriminatory effects of systemic racism. And fourthly, we should deconstruct the representations, the values, and the biases of the dominant culture. Just a few ideas, and of course, this is not in any way an exhaustive list. We should listen, hear, and convey the words of those who experience racism on a daily basis. We should prioritize, promote, support the presence of racialized people in our living and working environments, and demand their presence in other venues, on television programs, in schools, in cultural events, in sports, and so on. We should participate and or promote anti-racism educational programs. We should engage in deconstructing the social biases which we all have and fighting the stereotypes on which these biases rest. We should constantly question practices and ways of doing things which we consider normal or usual practices, but which are in fact discriminatory. And we should be critical of a world vision imbued with racism and sexism. I usually, I usually comment before starting that of course I'm speaking as a white person and what we see as being the role of white people within systemic racism. So to conclude, what we've presented are general avenues to be considered, but of course they must be as assessed and adapted in the light of each specific environment. In 2019, the Ligue des Droits et Libertés signed on to a petition initiated by anti-racist activists and racialized individuals demanding that a consultation on systemic racism, racism at the municipal level be held. During these consultations conducted by the Office de Consultation Publique de la Ville de Montréal in, in 2019, the Ligue presented a brief and took part in the hearings. A certain number of the measures I spoke to you about tonight were included in our brief. They were received positively by the city, but now we have to follow up on them and ensure that they are not shelved and hope that they will have concrete effects on the right to equality for all. Other measures are undoubtedly waiting to be invented. One thing is clear, it will never be enough to deal with a few rotten apples. A participant in an educational session on anti-racism that we offer drew the following parallel. She said, it's like dandelions. If you cut them, you no longer see them. But if you really want to get rid of them, you have to remove the roots. What a perfect image. The same can be said of systemic racism. If we want to rid society of systemic racism, we have to address the institutional, organizational practices and structural biases, as well as the dominant values and beliefs and their societal roots. All these small measures will help to weaken the underlying structure, but we must never forget that social change often is often induced by mass mobilizations. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Martine, for your presentation. The um, image you shared of dandelions reminded me of Angela Davis's words, radical simply means grasping things at the root. And that's certainly the approach we try to take. I really appreciated as well your comments on the ways in which insisting that we're equal can be a tactic to erase and perpetuate inequality. And that's something I think about uh, as part of InterParis, as part of an organization that's founded upon the principle of working among equals. And what that means for us is that we celebrate the leadership of our local partners, that we celebrate their expertise in their own context, but also that we must recognize the unequal conditions in, in which we work. Um, so um, yeah, thank you for that. 
Um, okay, now I'd like to invite uh, Alexandra to, to respond to the remarks from the two other panelists. And Alexandra, I realized I shortchanged you on your introduction earlier. I'm so sorry. So uh, here's a more fulsome one. Alexandra Pierre is chair of the board of La Ligue des Droits et Liberté, uh, and she's been active and working in community and women's groups for the past 15 years. Through her experiences as a community organizer and in the research community, she is interested in feminist issues as well as issues of migration and racism. She has been involved with La Ligue since 2014 and was recently elected president. Congratulations and uh, back to you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so a lot of very in interesting presentation. Thank you for that, really. Um, I wanted to reflect on uh, what Olive was saying about um, the invisibility or um, the fact that uh, Black people were nowhere to be seen or in a few places in politics, uh, on board of directions, as CEOs, etc. Uh, I think that's a very important point. Uh, for two reasons, uh, because uh, in this society, if you're com com competent, uh, uh, if you are able to do the job, you should be on those places. And we know that Black people, because of, of their education and their experience, uh, can fulfill uh, the... Um, uh, the Yeah, the, can... can, can get and, 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 and perform on those jobs. Uh, and I'm very, I think it's very important also to underline the effect of not seeing black people on, this, on those places for youth, young black people, but also uh, for everyone. It means that when you're uh, imagining Imagining a CEO, what you see is, okay, I'm going with a cliche, but it's not really a cliche. It's a white old man <laughs> in a costume. So we have to change also. It's, it's also about uh, how we imagine thing, I think. It's political, it's very concrete, but it's also what's in our mind. And I think what you underline Olive is uh, is very important. I want to know, I want to say that representation, however, and I, I don't think that this is at all what you're saying, Olive, that's quite the contrary, but I want to underline that representation without power doesn't mean anything. If we're just there to uh, approve, to say nothing, or to do business as usual, it doesn't do anything uh, to uh, to fight systemic racism or to uh, to have uh, the the place that we're sh the, the the place or the space that we're supposed to have. So for me, it's really important about the power and the idea of power or the idea of um, redistribution redistribution of power in a more uh, e e equal terms. Uh, mean also that it we need a mass critique, a critical mass. Like one people in a board of 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 all white person or people around, it won't change anything because this person will probably won't have uh, her voice um, uh, or his voice. This person will be in a setting not built for him or her. So it's very important, the idea of, for me, of critical mass. So we have to work, let's, that's one of the things we have to work on. Uh, also, I want to reflect on what Martin was saying about the posture from a white person or a rationalized person for all that matter, from I, I'm not racist, or I'm a victim, I'm an individual victim of racism, 
which is okay. Like that's that's a fair statement. But to that, to I'm impregnated, impregnated by this culture, by this way of thinking, by this way of doing things. And although uh, the position, and I think you did understand that, the position of white people and rationalized people are not the same on, on, in the system, but we are both in the system, that's for sure. So we have to think about it in that way. We're on this pool, we're trying to, to, uh, to get out of it, actually. So how can we do this together? We're not out of the pool, like looking and saying, oh, what, what, what's going on? When we're in it. We have to be sure that this is explicit and that we know uh, where we're at. And last thing, uh, for me, uh, uh, one, uh, one thing that Martin say, said and that we, uh, we focus a lot on at la Ligue des droits et libertés is that words are important. So it's the same thing. If we have the wrong diagnostic diagnosis, if we have the wrong words, so it's very difficult then to tackle the problem and to get to it. So a uh, cultural minority, visible minority, uh, cultural communities, all those words, um, I think in, when we talk about racism in other contexts, it's other thing, but when we talk about systemic racism is leading us uh, into a wall. It, for me, that sincerely doesn't make sense. Like when people talk about me and saying cultural community, what does that mean? I mean, uh, uh, I'm from Quebec. I, uh, I like to say that for Quebecois, they will understand. I know my passepartout. I know, <laughs> I know all that. What does that mean? I'm from this place and, and, and not even by choice. I, I love this place, but it's just, I'm here. So what does that mean to say cultural minority? Um, but what we can say is that I can be a victim of racism and of structural uh, uh, or uh, systemic racism. So for me, words are very, very important. And finally, finally, finally for, for, for real, uh, the idea of data. To collect data, uh, for me, it's central not only to prove racism, we have a lot of proof for that, but to follow how it evolved and how we uh, tackle or not uh, the issue. Thanks so much, Alexandra. Minority is always a word that gets under my skin because it's so often used as code, as you say, and to describe populations that aren't in fact minorities. Uh, like Olive, Olive said, the Black population in Canada is significant, but we don't see that in, in positions of power. And it's not appropriate to use the term minority when what we mean is oppressed, marginalized, uh, targeted by racism. Uh, I also really appreciate it. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, and in that sense, if you put together all the minorities, well, guess what? <laughs> it's a lot of people. Huh? So <laughs> let's, let's, let's use this word with, uh, with care. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and and I, I really appreciated your comments on uh, on inst on a critical mass too of, of representation. I think that there's often, I've noticed a trend of excitement around the first person to do this, the first black person to do this, the first woman to do this, the first racialized person without investigation of, well, why is that person the first person? Why haven't there been people before them? And also what it will be the experience of being the first person in this position when they are alone in a, a space of power that's that's not been built for them and what supports are needed to empower that person and to start to build up a critical mass. And these are questions that we are asking ourselves institutionally, certainly at Interpares, as we look uh, into how we can deepen our, our anti-racism anti as, as an organization. 
Um, so um, we've reached the discussion portion of the evening, and I want to start by saying that uh, Martine, Olive, Alexandra, if you have questions that you want to pose to each other or further reflection on each other's remarks, please go ahead and jump in with that. And for our uh, audience, please continue to, to send your questions uh, through the Q&A box, and I'll, I'll read them aloud to, to panelists. Um, I'd like to highlight uh, a question from uh, Rebecca to start us off, uh, who's asking any advice uh, to a white person, and I would ask this myself as a non-Black racialized person, for finding a good balance between giving space and standing back uh, and not burdening racialized people and Black people with all the work of addressing systemic racism. I, I, can, I can answer the question. Uh, at my side, you know, um, we are a society and we live together, you know, and I always tell my friends that when you haven't experienced um, problems in a society, you cannot imagine how it's easy to lose peace. So if I have a problem and I'm a black person and I, I'm your neighbor, I think it may impact you. So all this to, to answer the question to say that it's together. It's not question of giving space. It's question of taking the space, taking the space together. Meaning that if we are here presenting, and as you see, the panelists, we are black, white, if we can use those terminologies, and it's great because this is who we are. So to me, it's not a question of who is presenting, is trying to listen to everybody. Not only seeing people like on television as we see now, you know, those commentators or those people, analysts or those people who are journalists, I don't know, they are talking about racism and they are all of them together, uh, Western culture or white people or call them how you, 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 you want. And, there is nobody from those Russia's people to also be part of the discussion. That's the problem. The problem is that they are talking about it. The problem is that, is that they, they are not inclusive to ensure that people are together to, to, to put the diagnosis and also diagnose the, the problem and also to find solutions. So that's how I see things. Um, does anyone else want to chime in? Um, I was saying maybe I should jump in as a white person. Um, I don't think I can give any advice, but I certainly can share uh, thoughts and experience. Um, <clears throat> the committee of the Ligue des Droits et Libertés was, um, is, uh, um, there are people who are racialized and people who are not racialized. And we worked on the content of uh, the brochure um, together. However, I think that we have a responsibility as white people to, um, we have, as we said, like we're part of that system and we have a responsibility to take action. At the same time, if we recognize the system that we are, we do benefit from privileges in this, in this system, we also have to beware of sort of speaking over people who experience racism. So it requires, you know, a certain, um, self-criticism uh, to uh, recognize, well, I, I've been able to speak a lot, but I have to recognize that, that other people need to speak. Uh, and so it's that kind of, I would say, sensitivity to the experience of other people that we have to. Um, and again, I think it's, um, it's more easy to, to uh, think about when we think about how we would like um, uh, feminist men to behave, um, we want them to be allies and to um, fight against uh, uh, expressions of male chauvinism, but at the same time we want them to leave, uh, to, to give us space to, to wage our own struggle. So that's my thinking. Now, when, when we started offering this uh, workshop at the Ligue des Droits et Libertés, well, there was a question of, I'm, I'm one of the people who 
uh, it has more availability to offer the workshop, but I'm a white person. And so we discussed this and we came to the conclusion that because we believe that white people have a responsibility, I can't speak for racialized people, but I can certainly speak for uh, my understanding of the role that white people should have in, um, in uh, our fight against racism. So uh, I, I think there's no recipe. I think that it, what the, the only thing that is um, clear is that we have to have that kind of openness and sensitivity to, uh, to break away from, uh, from ingrained uh, power relations. I actually have a question for uh, Alive. Um, I want to ask, like, why Liverpool? I ask this question because there's a tendency to mix all rationalized people, Aboriginal people, and Black people. It's like a big package. But um, the experience of, uh, of Indigenous people and Black people who were getting their land stolen or being ripped of their land to come here is quite different, not uh, um, different, like no, uh, no, uh, no hierarchization here, it's just different. Um, not, a, not more important, just different. So was it part of your motive to like build Liverpool? Uh, Liverpool is, is really um, about uh, ourselves, meaning Black communities, member of Black communities, to take responsibility. And I like this word because, um, you know, it's true that when, when there is no space, we can push and push, but sometimes we get tired and then we stop doing anything, you know, but when you are many, and I said the number 1.2 million, imagine if these people, if who we are, we were able to get to get up and say, you know what, today enough is enough. And we say this, this, this territory, this government, this, uh, these laws and these policies, we can change them. We can change them in, in any way, meaning that we can occupy positions, we can elect people, we can talk to our, our represent, representative elected people, we can, we can do what we can together and make things change. That's the first thing. So take responsibility. This is the most important portion because as I said, and as we said, all of us, we talked about women and we know the struggle women went, went through and we know how many times it took. It didn't start by, by men, it started by women. And after men open up, so it's exactly the same. If we are together and we get, uh, we, 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 we get responsible and also we learn to know our strength because when you, you have been, hit so many times, you lose trust in yourself. So we have to build that. We have to come back together and say, you know what, we exist. And that was really the first person because after you can do anything, you can go and convince anybody. You can say, you know what, I can apply to this position. I can be elected. I can try many times, you know, to be elected, whoever, tried many, many, many people tried many times, but black communities member don't try enough because we don't have trust in ourselves. We don't have confidence in ourselves, right? So we have to build that and building that is having this type of discussion. If we talk about, and I, I'm finished with, I finish with this. If we are put together and saying uh, uh, minor, visible minorities, who, who we are, who we are, we don't know. So. We are lost in that. So it's why now we say we are black people and we want to strive for that. And we want to convince this part that, uh, people from, uh, with that, this. And we need to gain trust in ourselves, confidence in, in ourselves. So I would say that and the other portion is really convincing the other part, meaning governors and, uh, and politicians. So I don't know if I answered your question, but it starts, it starts with us. 
not yes, with other do. people. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Maybe I may have a question for Martin, if I, if I may, may I? Martin, what do you think about those questions I see in social media and even I think I saw it somewhere even on radio, I, I heard it, that there is anti-white racism. We said that, um, uh, we said earlier that systemic racism is uh, about power relations. So uh, I think that um, there's, um, there's a confusion in people's minds. Uh, you can have uh, a racialized person making, uh, uh, making derog uh, uh, derogatory comments uh, to, a, to a white person. <clears throat> and people will say, here, you see, this person, this is anti-white uh, racism. Uh, I think that that's not anti-white racism bec uh, because, basically because the next day that white person will just be able to have the same job, will be able to uh, rent an apartment, will, you know, it's, so that, uh, um, if there's not a, 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 law, a prolonged, uh, a prolonged um, power relation uh, that that is discriminatory and that and that creates uh, inequalities. Then what we're seeing is a conflict. Is um, you know insulting one person, insulting another, and so forth. And, and they happen to be of you know of different skin color, but it's not systemic racism. And we had this discussion because um, at one point uh, an Irish man said yes but we were in a, in a, a system of oppression uh, uh, from the British so we thought about this for a while to figure it out and finally we came to the conclusion that uh, there can be national oppression uh, there can be conflicts between groups um, but if this is not uh, does not translate into systemic inequalities then it's a conflict, it's national oppression, and you know, national, like 20 years later, uh, an Irishman that uh, uh, goes to Wall Street will not have any discriminatory effects of the fact that he's Irish, right? Um, so it's, it was a national oppression that put one group in, um, in, in inferior position to another, but it wasn't something that creates inequality uh, over the long term. Uh, and consequently can't be considered as so that if I ha was asked about what I think of uh, the possibility of white uh, of anti white racism, this is what I would answer. Merci Martin. Thanks for, for that distinction, Martin. I think it's clear the question of power is really key and I think that came up in all three of your remarks this evening. Um, Alexander, did you want to add anything or shall I uh, pose another question from the audience? Um, I just want to, like, uh, we had this conversation with Martin <laughs> before, like, actually. Um, I, I partly agree with what she's saying. I think that um, there can be, uh, like, we can qualify um, racial slur as race as racism it's based on racial uh, um, um, racial uh, uh, feature but i don't think at all it's systemic because as she was saying the next day she will probably that this person will probably not have any of this type of interaction and nobody will ask him where are you where do you come from or whatever so i don't think it's systemic racism however um if we're thinking about the history um i would say that in certain case uh people from ireland italian portuguese um they were qualify as another race and in that sense it was racism but for, I, I'm, 
I'm I'm thinking I'm talking while I'm thinking, but <laughs> I think it was racism. But um, uh, the thing with uh, racism, but also social ca categories, is that it's changed over the course of time. Mm -hmm. So what was in my sin was true for Italian or Portuguese is not true anymore. Like it's there's no distinction, political, ideological distinction between other white people and those people anymore. And also it's, uh, it, for me, this question is, uh, is kind of interesting because uh, as any social construct, being black, being white, being Latino, being Muslim, whatever, uh, change over time and that is an important thing that we have to think about like um, before 9-11 um, <coughs> Muslim or people seen as Muslim or Arab um, uh, had were discriminated but after that it was another ball game so it's changed over time and we Uh, we have, if we want to be precise on what we're fighting for, we have to take that also into, uh, onto, into consideration. Thanks, Alexandra. I think that really uh, is a nice way to bring it back to the point you made near the beginning of your presentation about race being a construct and a construct that changes over time. Martine, what also occurred to me in the example you shared about British oppression of the Irish is that those uh, examples are examples of, of colonial oppression and imperial oppression and, and mm -hmm. there are systems of power at play there mm -hmm. and what whether or not what's happening is is racism we know that throughout history racism and colonialism and imperialism imperialism have have intersected in, in really profound and, and damaging ways so mm -hmm. um, I appreciate mm -hmm. all of your perspectives I'd like to um, pose now another question uh, from Jan in the audience, um, who is reflecting on, on Alexandra, what you said about critical mass. They share, they've heard that in a small organization of, of a less, about uh, less than 20 people, um, or, or a, a board of directors, there must be at least three Uh, BIPOC, which stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color uh, members in order to really have a voice. So they're asking what you think about that. And I'd like to expand this question, if I may, and, and also ask what other factors should we be aware of or what conditions can we work towards in terms of supporting BIPOC people in these positions and spaces of power where they haven't traditionally had a place or haven't traditionally been welcome? That's a very interesting question. There's all sorts of uh, theory and strategy about that. But um, I think what he's referring to is the fact that when uh, there's um, this critical mass, in the, I, I guess it depends on, on the institution and organization and uh, how, how it's organized. But the idea of the critical mass or the minimum is that uh, when a person reflect on his reality or his own analysis of this, of, of a reality, uh, then um, it will be erred if uh, this person has an echo in the same room. So I guess that's why the three people, look, I'm saying, In, in our organization, we have a problem. Why, why is it so difficult for BIPOC to be uh, in the board? And then if you're alone, silence, another question will be raised or another uh, conversation will be started. But if there's two or three or four people, um, maybe another conversation will uh, another people will try to uh, to to start another conversation but the other person will be there huh that's like i want to go back to what alexander was saying that was interesting i think that's a problem what should we do and then the other person will be yeah you're right what should we do and then there's an echo so i guess that's 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 why that's that's why the the idea of critical mass is so important in an organization mm -hmm. 
and it's a, it's a, how to share um, to share the power of saying things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so yeah. Uh, what was the the other question? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, maybe I overloaded it. Uh, I was asking about um, what else to consider besides critical mass when we're thinking about how spaces and positions of power can better support and encourage BIPOC leadership. Hmm. I think critical mass is important, you know, but also where where people are at. I'm going to give you a very concrete example. Uh, I'm, I'm working, I've been working for a few years for a feminist organization and uh, the conversation about um, being more inclusive, that's another word we should think about, but that's another question. Being inclusive and uh, um, uh, uh, make sure that people from all sorts of culture and background um, and racials racialized people uh, uh, should be welcome, women should be welcome. And then what we see is that there's the, the um, feminist group um, uh, have done the job, especially for people participating into activities, but um, uh, people working there, not so much. People on the board, not so much. So it's, very, it's great that members uh, are diverse and there's a, a rationalized people there, but <clears throat> um, the sense of who's in charge and who has the real power um, is, uh, is interesting in this case because uh, rationalized, rationalized women are mainly into uh, the group of participants. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. for me, that's a challenge also. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if, if I may add, uh, is, uh, it's why uh, the, the, the big importance of, um, of awareness. Um, yes, I agree with critical mass, but uh, also I, I, I believe in, in starting. Uh, because uh, we cannot start as um, as many. It's it's impossible. It's impossible mm -hmm. to start like uh, with the critical mass. Mm -hmm. But we build we, we build that. Mm -hmm. You have to start first. And if each I know that uh, that Alexandra uh, raised a, an issue about culture, <laughs> community. Com <laughs> uh, but but I would say if those different Russian population uh, as black people as uh, Asian people, if they can, how they call them, if they raise voice about being aware about who they are as citizen and all together, and we represent what Canada is, we represent what Quebec is, we represent what Montreal is, we represent what Toronto is, there will be no issue. Let's imagine that, as I remember, I don't remember what numbers are good, but I think in Toronto, there may be 40, 42% people, Russia's people or what, however we call that. So imagine uh, a, a, a board um, um, members, uh, members of a board, they, if they are from those diverse, um, color or culture or, or uh, differentiations, and they sit together, you know, there will be much difference. It's not about having only black people sitting on 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 board of of directors. No, it's not that. That's not the question. The question is, let's have representation of who we are. Yes, I talk for I talk about for black people, but I don't ignore that other people are are speaking too. And I I, I we have collaboration with indigenous. Even we have uh, we have conversation tomorrow around what we can learn from indigenous people, that concept of nation to nation uh, as black communities. That's very interesting. Now we, we start building together. We start having discussion even among ourselves. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that we will only have, it's only between Russia's people because we also speak to, to white people, to uh, my neighbors. I'm president of, of a neighborhood association and my neighbors are not black people, you know? So it's a question of, of of thinking that we also have we, we also can have power, so I, to me it, and that's build who we are. If they make you minister and they just 
uh, took you because whatever, uh, and then you are among people, but you didn't build yourself, you know, sometimes it doesn't change much. I think it's what Alexandra was speaking about. It's not only about mass, it's also about how I perceive myself, how I believe in who I am, how I, I, I trust who I am, and that recognizing myself before even trying to to get into power. And when I get power, then I will have that uh, self-esteem of myself and I can have a discussion with whoever. And I can also hire people, not to have, have a shame of hiring somebody who is like me, because that's another problem we have. How many black people would say, you know what, if I hire this person, they will say that I'm giving him or her a favor. That's, that's wrong. And we and, and you know that it's true. So it's a question of also empowering, empower, empowerment, uh, getting, getting that uh, self-esteem in ourselves. Thanks so much for that, Aline. Um, so we're nearing the end of uh, the evening, but I think we have time for maybe uh one more question and then i'd also like to invite just any closing uh closing reflections from the three of you um so maybe maybe actually we can fit in two because there's a, a quick question about um your problem uh, problematization of the word inclusive alexandra could you just uh exp explain that briefly oh quickly um, for me, inclusion, when we're talking about systemic racism in other contexts, uh, maybe not, is also an euphemism. To include is to have an already existing setting where you generously welcome others. It doesn't change the question of building others. And, um, uh, and it's like, I don't know how to say that quickly, but it's like considering considering that um, uh, that uh, you're kind of entitled to this place, space mm -hmm. or whatever, and then you're welcoming the other um, instead of building with them. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's one of the problem with inclusion in this context. It, it, it reveals a certain power relation. Mm -hmm. You're in the power, you have the power to welcome others instead of working together. And again, if I go, but I, I know that my situation is not the situation of every resized person, but if I can reflect on my own experience, uh, when, I, when people tell me, although I, I know it's not from a bad intention, but, but when people tell me, I want to include you in whatever manner, I'm like, well, I'm already there. <laughs> That's <laughs> also my place. So what do, what, what do you mean? <laughs> so that's my reaction. I would only like to, to reflect on something. Um, just to let you know that Liderpour is doing a job which is like similar to what Equal Voice does or Group Family Democracy do. They, they provide training, they do awareness. So it's not really about uh, thinking that we will get there tomorrow, but uh, it will take time and we are ready for that. So it's really, we are learning from those people. We're learning from women. And I always say that, and we have to. Uh, because we, we cannot do things ignoring that we have people who did already. So we are, we, 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 we have, we, we should go faster than them, right? Because we, we, we see that we can, we can reflect on what they did. Thank you so much, Alniv. Um, I think it is a good point maybe for closing reflections. Um, Alexandra Martin, um, if you could take maybe a, a minute each to share. We, I just want to say thank you. Um, and um, I love those conversations uh, because that's where we learn together. I learned a lot of things to, to, today, uh, tonight, but that's where we build together. I think that's important. Um, as uh, we were saying all along this panel, uh, we are in this pool together. So we have to learn from each other without, um, without forgetting our, our own position, but we're still together on this school. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> um, 
Did you want to go, Olive, or shall I go? I, I thought I did mine, but uh, okay. I agree with that, and uh, it, it's fantastic. I'm learning, and, and uh, seriously, I think I have your presentation, both of you, but I still need to have it. So um, thank you so much, and thank you for, to Enter Paris to organize this. Yes, uh, ditto for me too. Um, uh, I, I was saying, I was thinking during this discussion that uh, it's uh, it's really uh, an occasion where um, we're having conversations where we uh, explore together and not just come out with uh, already made solutions, which ne that never works anyways. So it's really important to have these conversations. And just as a note of perhaps hope. <laughs> Uh, we, we, we mentioned the importance of speaking of, um, of systemic racism and the fact that not everybody agrees. Um, it's true that not everybody agrees, but I must say that um, I'm, really, um, I, I I'm really surprised since last summer how often there's almost not a day or two uh, without uh, an article which uses the term systemic racism. And you could say, well, they're just using that term, but doesn't mean anything. Well, often you, I, I saw articles where it was clear that they really understood what it was about. So of course it's not all one, but my personal impression is that our prime minister is sort of in a minority actually. There are not many voices that raise, that are ra that raise up and that agree with him. And those that even some of people close to him seem to not use the word because they know they can't, but, you know, sort of understand what's on. I mean, I'm not trying to say there's no problem. I'm not trying to say that we've all won it. And even when everybody says it, you have to ensure that people really know what they're and that they are putting that they're going to do something about it once they understand what this is all about. Um, but I still think that things have moved forward and that although it seems like a terribly great endeavor. Um, past struggles have shown that we can change things over time. It won't happen tomorrow morning, but there's reason I think to um, to uh, believe that we, well, we don't have a choice anyways, we have to. If we don't want to continue living and, and creating these terrible inequalities and discrimination and, and awful things, then we have to. But I think there's also hope that it will be, that it is possible to change uh, through uh, a variety of actions um, over time. Thank you, Martin. I love the way you use minority talking about Lego. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, sorry, I just messed up the view settings, um, which is inconvenient because what I want to do is thank uh, all of our, our uh, panelists for joining us this evening um, and, and for all our uh, audience members for uh, joining um, us. Um, it's been a real honor and privilege to join in this conversation with you. We will send around a recording of this webinar, uh, as well as resources for further action. And I encourage you to stay engaged with InterParis, of course, but uh, also with La Ligue and with LeaderPoll to check out their work, to follow them online, to financially support them if you have that capacity. There was a question about Alexandra's presentation at the beginning, and that was a shortened version of educational sessions that La Ligue runs. Um, so, you know, check them out if that's something you're interested, they can be hired to do that. Um, and uh, yeah, once again, just thank you to our panelists. Thank you to Mary too, uh, our tech support. And thanks to all of you, our lovely audience for being with us this evening. Thank you. And thanks to you, Charlotte. Thank you yeah, so much. Thanks. It was a great evening. Thank Have you. Have a great night, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.